one of the many, many skills we need to master in our study in science is that of showing data, not as numbers, but as a picture. And we call that a graph. Sometimes we call it, if it's got numbers and lines, we normally call it a graph. Sometimes we can make a chart, like a pie chart, or a column or bar chart. It depends upon what we are measuring and what we are trying to do. We're going to concentrate on line graphs, like the one I have here, where we have a line going up through here. Now I've just grabbed this one off the internet for us to look at, so we can decide what's going on. The real reason we use graphs and charts is because a lot of people find it easier to look at pictures rather than numbers. They can quickly see if the num picture changes at all, if it goes up, if it goes down, if it's flat, if it's angled, or if it's curved. They can see these things, and so this allows them to see what's going on really, really quickly. And that's why it's an important thing for us to try to do. We need to make sure we can do that. Now, typically when we do a graph, our teacher will give us a grid pattern like this one. Now on our grid we can see there are darker lines and lighter lines. And we can see there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 lines effectively between each dark line. And that makes it easy for us to decide what we are doing and where the numbers are or where our points go. And um, this is really, really important because we need to make sure that the spaces are along here. It's not like we take out numbers and add numbers in to make it different or make it flat or make it whatever we want to do. We always make sure that the, the space or the line, the difference between these lines here, that, or between these major lines, is the same. So if that is a difference of two, that also is a difference of two, and that is a difference of two and etc. all the way up this side. But, because we're on a different thing, we've got a vertical axis up here and a horizontal axis here. On the horizontal axis, this can be 1, 2, 5, 10. That depends upon what we need it to be. So we always make sure that in the case of going up here, our highest number should be about there, and our lowest number is down here somewhere. Same applies to this axis too. Our lowest number is down in the corner and our highest number is here. Now we leave a bit of space on the outside because sometimes we might like to think about what happens if that pattern keeps going. And we can do what's called extrapolate, which means extend. And we can say, from what we've seen, this would possibly happen. Alright, so it's really important we get this right and things in the right place. So, let's look at ways of doing things. Whenever we set up our axes, we've already decided that our maximum number goes up here, our minimum number should be here, and then we'll have equal spacing. But we've got to tell the reader what these numbers are about. And so we put a label on here. Now, I would suggest that you have whatever you are measuring goes up and what you are changing goes here. Now, again, we start off with the lowest number here and the highest number up here, just in case we decide to extend it a little bit more. It is most important that we evenly space. So there is no, I don't sort of say 1, 5, 6, 7, 15, 22, 43. I don't do things like that because it will affect what our graph looks like. So I must have equal spacing 
regardless. So when you first start, you should decide what one of these little squares correspond to. Now there's a difference between that and that. Is it going to be number one? Is it going to be point one? You tell me. We work it out and then you work from there. So I've put a thing here and I've put some numbers on. Now notice I haven't started from zero. But notice also that one, two gaps is 20. One, two gaps is still 20. One, two gaps is still 20. One, two gaps is still 20. So I've done that. I've told the person who was looking at this chart that I'm measuring the temperature of water up here and it's in degrees C. And down the bottom, I'm measuring how long I'm heating it. Now notice I start off with zero because that tells me before I started heating, it was this temperature. Now, also at the top, I'll put it here so you can see it, but I would normally have this outside my grid. So I've got told the reader that we are looking at how the temperature of water changes as it is heated. And we can see that we've got the temperature here and we've got the heating time here. So I've combined both of these ideas in our title. Don't just write temperature versus heating time. That doesn't tell me that much and it doesn't tell the reader that much. Right, so we can see here that we have got a lot of data that someone has gathered about heating water. All right, we can see that before we started heating, it was 23. After one minute of heating, it had gone up to 31. After two minutes, it was now 43. Three, it was 56, etc. on the way down. Now, it's most interesting to see down here, it actually slows down but that's a different story. So let's try to put some of these numbers onto our graph and see what goes on. So, if we go back, we see that after two, it's 43. After three minutes, it's 56. Four, 69. Let's put the last couple of numbers in. Then we go to 95, 97, and then 398. I've put on here, each one of these lines, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So each one of these lines corresponds to one degree C. So we said it was 23 after one minute. All right, before we started. After one minute, which is be here. I could have put one, two, three, four, five, six, etc. Long way here. Notice I've left them out. I've left some numbers out, but I still know how much is there. So after one minute, which is here, I've gone up this line to look up to 31. And I've just counted 11 up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So there's 31. So what we would have is we would have to 2, we go up the 2 line to 40, 41, 42, 43, there. Alright, and then we would continue on and plot all the points. That's what it means by plotting the points. Now most times we will tell you to use a little cross, not a dot. And please, when we're doing this, always plot in terms of pencil. Use pencil because if we make a mistake, it's so much easier to fix up. Right, let's put the rest of these points in. So I'm going to go back and look at them. So three, there's 50. One, two, three, four, five, six. After, and then 87, 60, 9, then 87. I remember that number from when I was looking at a minute ago. And 95, 97, and 398. One, two, 
3. So we've got our points plotted. Now the last thing we should do, and it's referring, so hey, I'm going to put a smooth line on here in blue. So I start off here and I go up through the points and like that. Okay, so we've got that done, and now we can say we have completed our graph, and we see that it goes up, and it's almost even, it gets a bit quicker here, a bit quicker here, starts off nice and steady, gets a bit quicker, and then it flattens off, and maybe we could like it to be do is then doing a smooth line. Now I've just put this one on here because it's a step to explain that a bit later. Now I've put this in because someone decided this is a good idea for your, you to have. It's like a checklist. We might sort of sort one of these out later. Alright, so it tells us all these things we're doing. Now this might be something useful for us to have as we go in further along in our NYP studies. What I'm going to ask you to do is now you've done this, and I will let you go back and through this again, is this shows you how to do a line graph. And I'm going to ask you to do one for me. We are going to gather data in experiment. We are going to make a table of these numbers. Then we are going to plot the points on grid paper, and we're going to use a smooth curve to do it. We're also going to add labels and numbers just like we've got here and then the last thing we're going to do is you're going to describe the shape of your graph all right so this is our task to do our to do thing at the end of this